a dire warning from the UN about Burundi's escalating violence. The dire state of mental health services on the continent. And guess who just joined Facebook? Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. The United Nations says extrajudicial killings, torture and detentions are increasing in Burundi and that the international organization is less equipped to deal with the situation than it was in Rwanda before the 1994 genocide. At a special Security Council session on Burundi Monday, the UN's Under Secretary General for Political Affairs, Jeffrey Faltzman, warned that violence in Burundi is in danger of escalating to mass atrocity crimes. Under Secretary Faltzman made the plea on Monday after a weekend of violence left nine people dead in Bujumbura. The discovery of the bodies of civilian victims, many apparently summarily executed, has become a regular occurrence in several neighborhoods of Bujumbura. Feltman said that while the United Nations supports national dialogue efforts, it will not be able to make progress if killings and widespread impunity continue. Burundi finds itself in a deep political crisis and rapid escalation of violence that has serious implications for stability and ethnic harmony in Burundi, as well as peace and security in the region. The political, economic, social, and security gains that came out of the landmark Arusha agreement are already at risk. Connected via video link from Geneva, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Zaid Raad Al Hussein, also condemned the killings. Al Hussein outlined confirmed cases of human rights abuses and expressed alarm at the worsening situation in the country. Uh, President Nkurunziza announced uh, the opening of a piece uh, of a sort of a process, I'm sorry, of national uh, dialogue in September. But I regret to report that to date it has fallen short of the truly inclusive de discussion that would effectively put the country back on a path to peace. Uh, repeated killings of opposition leaders, human rights defenders and their families sharply undermine the government's verbal commitments to reconciliation. He also appealed to the Security Council to take all the necessary steps to prevent the escalation of violence, including freezing the assets of those involved in the killings. In response, the prominent observer of the African Union to the United Nations, Tete Antonio, said that the African Union has stepped up its initiatives to restore peace. Only a sincere and inclusive dialogue based on the respect of the Arusha agreement will make it possible for Burundi to find a consensual solution to preserve peace and to consolidate democracy and the rule of law. Burundi's Foreign Affairs Minister Alain Yamwita told the Security Council on Monday that Burundi is not in flames, that there are certain acts of crime attempting to attract the attention of the international community, but they are being reined in. On to West Africa now. Ahead of the 20th anniversary of the execution of Ken Sharu Wewa and nine other Ogoni activists campaigning in the Niger Delta, an investigation by Amnesty International has found that areas hit by the spills remain contaminated years after Shell claimed to have successfully cleaned them up. The Amnesty International report says Shell has failed to fulfill its legal obligations to clear up oil spills that it has caused, uh, that has caused pollution in Nigeria's oil-rich Niger Delta region. Sarawiwa and the other Nigerian environmental justice activists were hanged in 1995 by Nigeria's then military government for leading protests again against uh, Royal Dutch Shell over pollution and a lack of development, provoking an international outcry and turning Nigeria into a pariah state. Mark Dumit, a researcher on business and human rights, is frustrated that the region is still polluted. It's upsetting to see the Niger Delta, to go to the Niger Delta, and to see that the pollution is still there. Ken Sarawiwa and the Ogoni people campaigned um, for a cleanup, and that cleanup hasn't happened yet. Well, according to Reuters, a spokesman for Shell's Nigeria unit, a Shell Petroleum Development Company, said it was difficult to respond to the allegations without having seen the report.
Still in the region, after spending more than a decade in power, the Sierra Leone People's Party lost the presidency in 2007. Now the party then retreated into opposition as a fractured party, cash-strapped and bereft of practical ideas and powerless against President Ernst by Koroma's alleged transgressions. Uh, but Andrew Cayley, one of the leading opposition leaders, says given the opportunity, he will bring about fundamental changes. Cayley recently spoke to Africa 54's Paul Ndiho about the plans for his country. First of all, uh, as much as uh, President Kuruma has made his own improvements in infrastructure and other things, I think that we have to ensure that these improvements are sustainable. Also, although um, quite a little bit of a a national budget is spent on the social sectors. Uh, our health system is in the doldrums. I mean, you saw the fragility of our health system with the recent Ebola crisis. Mm -hmm. As I've mentioned, education is in the doldrums. So there, there, I will try to empower Sierra Leoneans so that we take hold of our own destiny. There are lots of things that could be done, but we have not capacitated. And this is what I'll concentrate on, capacitating the, the human resources and then being able to manage uh, our natural resources very well so that we can forge ahead. You're running for president. Yes. Uh, of course, that's the most uh, powerful office in the land. Yes. Uh, so tell us, uh, what uh, gives you an edge? Uh, what are you bringing to the table? I think what I bring to the table is 38 years of unblemished blemish experience. I also bring to the table private sector experience. Uh, lo lots of my work that I've done has been in the private sector. I bring business experience. I bring experience of also being on policy issues, having been on the National Policy Advisory Committee to the President of Sierra Leone, the last president. I have also been in the corporate world, been a chairman of a major bank, uh, headed the Social Security Scheme. So I know issues in Sierra Leone, and I actually walk the walk and talk the talk. How about uh, our critics who say that uh, the opposition is just uh, mere rhetoric? It's just talking, uh, but uh, they have no ways of implementing some of the things that they're talking about. The opposition is uh, fractionated at the moment, but uh, we are on the throes of a peace process. Uh, we've gone very far. In fact, when I go back home, uh, we, we have another peace conference. We're trying to make peace within the party, and I think we'll succeed in doing that. Why are you different from uh, the current president? Well, first of all, I will tell you that my record in Sierra Leone speaks for itself in both the public and private sector. I will bring probity to Sierra Leone. I will bring experience of the public and private sectors to Sierra Leone. I'm a good listener. Uh, I will listen to people. If you are to take power tomorrow, are there some policies that you would adapt as your own or uh, carry on with uh, the, some programs that uh, have been implemented so far? I think they, they've done some work in the infrastructure sector, although I wish that they would make some of these work sustainable and then they would be much more transparent with what is being done. Uh, but by and large, I think there are lots of things that they've done that I don't necessarily subscribe to, like uh, the, the divide in the country is being accentuated, and also uh, the fact that uh, political, more political space needs to be provided for the opposition. Well, his name is French for angel. Uh, that seems appropriate for Ange in an Himishwe. A, conserv a conservationist from Rwanda who is a sort of a guardian angel of the national park he grew up in. In our continuing series on young African leaders who interned in the U.S., we hear how Ange saved his own environment and got to learn how the U.S. is working to save its own. Ange Imanishimwe is passionate about nature. He's not just a tour guide at a national park back home in Rwanda, but he came up with a plan to save the environment from poachers who were destroying his beloved ecosystem. I developed the approach of what I can call win-win situation. I said, let me put in place um, a community-based organization which can engage the community in a biodiverse conservation, but also which can provide the economic development to the community around the Nyungwe National Park. Ange was named Rwanda's top young innovator in 2012. Okay. With the grant money he won, he created a cooperative yes. and he educated the poachers and introduced them to a new method of feeding their families and making use of their land. Ange purchased cows and got the poachers involved in a milk collection cooperative and the raising of livestock. 
he ended up creating 800 jobs. Now we gave jobs to the people who were poachers before. And now what we're doing is to see how we can create more green jobs and make sure that the people can be really um, very healthy. Ange's love of the environment and his passion to save it is what inspired him to become a young African leader. After studying civic leadership at the University of California at Berkeley, he was able to intern at Boston's Nature Conservancy. Apart from the lecture circuit, Ange's internship has been a hands-on experience with Mother Nature. We are now on our way to Block Island to see the migratory birds and the other animal species. Block Island is a national wildlife refuge located 19 kilometers off the coast of the state of Rhode Island. Block Island is well known for more than 40 species of wildlife classified as rare and endangered. Moreover, it's a well-known stopover for thousands of migratory birds. Ornithologist Scott Cummings, he explains the frequent flyer pattern of the black and white warblers. He'll fly 800 miles across the Gulf of Mexico in one flight. 800 miles? 800 miles. He'll leave, ah. he'll leave like 6 o'clock at night. Yeah. and he'll arrive at between yeah. 11 and 1 the next day yeah. in the morning. Cummings and his group are licensed by the government to attach stainless steel bands to the migratory birds, known as bird banding, a means of studying the bird's migratory patterns. And then, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best part. A local beekeeper shared his tips on honey production Ange can bring back to Africa. He's uh, making 40 kilos per hive per year and he has about 50 beehives and he's making two tons a year. So it is really interesting and I think it is what African people we can learn from him. We have potential markets in Western countries. Birds and beehives aside, the highlight of Ange's experience was his first dip in the ocean. I'm going to swim in Atlantic Ocean and it is a great experience for me, so I'm very excited. Uh, my country is landlocked, and this is a great opportunity to see the ocean and to see um, the animals, you know, and the plants in the ocean. So I'm very excited. While Ange gained a lot of knowledge during his internship, he also did his part to give back to those who made him feel so welcome. We learned so much from him, especially about community-based conservation. I mean, that's. He is on the forefront of that, being at the grassroots level. I think I'm really very happy because uh, what I learned in the U.S. met my expectations. And now I feel a very important person who can go and change the whole continent in terms of economic development. Well, we want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we covered. Join the conversation on Facebook. Uh, the address is Africa 54 and check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCorry. Now coming up, uh, good news for meningitis patients in Africa. Stay with us. news and notes. This is Living Better. Scientists in the United Kingdom say they may have found a way to detect signs of schizophrenia much earlier using brain scans. The researchers are looking at the activity of immune cells called microglia. Microglia respond to damage and infection in the brain and people with schizophrenia have high levels of these immune cells. This is the first indication of a new approach to treating schizophrenia. And the thing that, that I, I think is striking is that over the last 60 years, we've had no new fundamentally different approaches. The study in the American Journal of Psychiatry reports that microglia brain cells became increasingly active according to the severity of a patient's symptoms. Scientists say the research may not lead to a cure, but may lead to a better understanding of mental illnesses. I'm Martin Seacrest for VOA's Living Better. Welcome back. Uh, joining us now is Africa 54 health correspondent Lino Madu. Hello, Lino. 
experts say a mass vaccination program against meningitis A in Africa is a great success. More than 220 million people were immunized with the new vaccine, Menafrivac, across 16 countries in Africa's meningitis belt, from Gambia to Ethiopia. Vaccination campaigns will be rolled out in the remaining 10 meningitis belt states by 2017, according to the Meningitis Vaccine Project, a partnership between the World Health Organization and the charity PATH. Menafrevac was designed specifically for Africa, and in 2010, a mass vaccination campaign was started. Meningitis A bacteria causes inflammation of the lining of the brain and spinal cord, resulting in fever, trembling, and in severe cases, seizures and death. The World Health Organization recently changed its guidelines for the treatment of HIV. The WHO now recommends that all HIV-positive people begin, begin taking antiretroviral drugs when diagnosed instead of waiting until their white blood cell counts, known as CD4 levels, drop below a level. Lenny Ruvaga reports for VOA from Nairobi that implementing these new guidelines could be a challenge for Kenya. Jacinta Wangeshi takes her daily dose of antiretroviral medication known as ARVs, which slow the advance of the disease. The single mother of two has been living with HIV for 11 years. She gets her medication for free at her local health center on the outskirts of Nairobi. But there are other challenges. I'm taking these drugs. Whether you have food or not, you have to take them at the right time and the right, the right, and the right time. The second challenge is that there is that stigma where you have a visitor in your house and your, your time of taking the drug has come, but you fear for that person to know whether you are HIV or not. The National AIDS Control Council says there are approximately 1.6 million people confirmed to be living with HIV and AIDS in Kenya, but only about half are on ARV therapy. Some of the challenges include stigma and discrimination, lack of meaningful involvement of people living with HIV and AIDS. Government has not yet synthesized the community on the guidelines, on the new guidelines. The new WHO guidelines mean the number of people in Kenya who need ARVs could at least double. The government launched a new digital application, the Situation Room, to better coordinate response efforts. Users can tell how many people are infected with HIV and AIDS in an area, how many are on medication, and what amount of medicine is available in the local health facility. The government says the supply of ARVs is not a problem. We have a minimum of six months worth of ARVs for people who are taking medicines in the country at any one time. And we distribute medicines to the facility on a monthly basis. But getting people to come in for testing remains an issue. Authorities believe there could be as many as half a million more HIV-positive people in Kenya who don't know it yet but could benefit from early treatment. Lenny Ruvaga for VOA News, Nairobi. Now to describe the current state of mental health services in most countries as deficient would be an understatement. In Africa, statistics indicate the psychiatrist to patient ratio is less than 1 to 100,000. Solomon Abo tells us more. According to the World Health Organization, mental health in many African countries has grown from bad to worse. In some cases, the situation has been exacerbated due to armed conflict. Psychiatric to patient ratio is less than 1 to 100,000. Dr. Eko Asari, a native of Ghana, is a psychiatrist at the American College of Cardiology. She describes the situation as unfortunate. It's tragic and it's pitiful and it is unnecessarily so. Uh, what you have is a situation where you already have strapped governments when it comes to economics, when it comes to just the infrastructure of the political movements there, right? So first of all, you have to understand that if your underlying foundation is not solid, then anything else that you add cannot be solid. With limited accessibility to mental health facilities, mental health patients resort to traditional and faith healers for treatment. 
There are documented cases of mental health patients being isolated from their communities for a long period of time without adequate food or shelter. Dr. Sari says people need to change their attitude towards mental health patients. Individuals who suffer from mental illnesses are people. You have got to get that in your psyche, in your soul, in your being. They're not dogs, they're not less than you. They are human beings. And you must treat them with the compassion and respect and care that they deserve. Dr. Sari says for Africa countries to maximize on human productivity, mental health treatment must be paramount on the agenda. The barometer of your country's health is not merely the absence of illness, but the presence of absolute wellness. And if you want to have a people who are thriving and who are giving back into your economy, you have got to take into absolute consideration their mental health. Given the steady rise in the number of mental health patients in Africa, governments need to put in place sound mental health care systems to cater for these most vulnerable members of the society. Solomon Abo, VOA News, Washington. That's our Africa Health Report for today. Vincent? Well, and thank you very much for joining us today, Lenore. Be sure to watch for Lenore Madu every Tuesday and Thursday for the latest health news in Africa right here on Africa 54. What is time now for a short break? Still to come on Africa 54. Uh, need a new online friend? Well, check out Fix Facebook's newest subscriber. We'll be right back. la situation d'un continent africain. And welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. He may be coming to the end of his presidency, but it is apparently not too late in the game for President Barack Obama to get on Facebook. While many of the president's initiatives make it to the White House Facebook page, Obama is using his new public figure Facebook page to advocate for environmental protection. Analysts say they see Obama's commitment to reduce greenhouse gas as a key part of the president's legacy on fighting global warming before he leaves the White House. His message is bound to have wide reach. He already has over 45 million followers. Next up, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas at London's annual Spirit of Christmas Fair. Experts here are predicting a holiday season filled with new, original and inventive Christmas trends. That includes artificial lead tree makers, enchanted trees. When it comes to dazzling lighting, the company sees customers getting much more inventive with their festive displays, talking, taking inspiration from blooming springtime cherry blossom trees. Even traditional Christmas cake seems off the menu at Spirit of Christmas. In its place is Christmas-themed gingerbread and chocolate houses that can be built with kits. As for the hottest colors to decorate inside your home, experts are expecting festive decorations to reflect the growing trend in silver and gray interior designs. And that's what's trending today, Vincent. Well, thanks a lot. Now, there's a growing interest in the American civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s as tourists flock to museums and landmarks that chronicle the history of African Americans' uh, quest for equal rights. Communities in the South and U.S. are embracing the painful memories of the past with hopes of luring tourism dollars and educating the public. Here's VOA's Chris Simpkins. 
Uh, back and forth. Former Atlanta Mayor Shirley Franklin cherishes the personal letters of civil rights leader Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at the city's newest civil rights landmark. I think that gives people a much fuller uh, understanding of who he was and what influenced him. Franklin spearheaded efforts to secure King's papers and build the Center for Civil and Human Rights. I thought it would be a success because we're filling a gap in American history and certainly Atlanta history. It's very hard to find this much about civil rights in one place in Atlanta. Atlanta is one of many communities that are embracing the dark chapters of their past. Civil rights attractions here are visited by more than a million people every year. Former Mayor Andrew Young says people want to discover the history made here. I think Atlanta is one of the leading centers cities for civil rights tourism. I mean, that's our civil rights legacy. In Alabama, the site of many civil rights battles 50 years ago, thousands visit the state every month to see dozens of historic sites. And while we've made a lot of progress... Fred Gray started this history museum in Tuskegee. The state of Alabama, and particularly the Department of Tourism, now recognize the fact that civil rights is an engine for economic growth and development, and that we need to preserve that history. For these tourists, visiting civil rights sites is an emotional experience. Well, you can feel the effort and the empowerment, that, the fact that they fought here, and you can just feel all the emotion and feeling. There's so many people um, want to know. And, and so many people need to know, our children need to know um, their uh, history in order to go forward. Back in Atlanta, plans are already underway for an expansion at the Civil Rights Center while developing more programs for young people. Hello, how are you? A lot of these events took place long before they came of age politically, so they don't know about this. It's important to have that, um, you know, uh, legacy preserved and, and uh, for posterity. This is the birth home of Dr. Martin Luther King. It's one of many landmarks that dot the landscape. Community leaders say they want to make Atlanta the leading city in the country for civil rights tourism. Chris Simpkins, VOA News, Atlanta. Well, and that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VA's evening radio show, African News Tonight, at 18 and at UTC. And in the mornings to Daybreak Africa, between 0300 and 0600 UTC, that is Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching. From all of us in Washington, have a good night. Welcome to the Voice of America's News Words. Here is a story that has to do with defects or problems with cars. Listen for the word that means to take back something. Recall. They had meetings over this defect. They shared complaints over this defect. Yet there was no investigation by the government and no recall by General Motors until 10 years later. Recall. It is a word that means to ask people officially to return something. In our story, there were major problems with some General Motors cars. The man says the U.S. government and the car company took too long to issue a recall so the cars could be fixed. Now, when you hear the word recall, your American English will be good enough to know what this news word means.